Hi guys, welcome back to Wild Side Wednesdays. Today we're going to be talking about the seabirds of Hawaii. Now I know a lot of people don't get too excited when talking about birds, but we have a lot of really cool species out here that are completely adapted for life on the ocean. So we'll just go over a few of those species that uh, you might have the chance to see if you come visit the Hawaiian Islands and also maybe if you're out on one of our trips. Now what qualifies as a seabird? Uh, seabirds are birds that live beyond the intertidal or surf zone and they have a variety of specialized adaptations for life at sea. Uh, such as webbed feet for swimming, uh, air sacs in their chest to protect their organs when diving, long slim wings for catching drafts in the open ocean, dense waterproof feathers, and also specialized glands to get rid of or expel salt water. Uh, now there are about 300 species of seabird worldwide, and we have about two dozen that we see here uh, in the Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands throughout the year. So why should we learn and care about seabirds? Well, seabirds consume a variety of prey such as fish and squid and krill, and they are responsible for the movement of a lot of productivity and nutrients in marine ecosystems and also on land, uh, fertilizing soil through their guano or their poop. You can also see seabirds uh, throughout Hawaiian history. It's said that Polynesian sailors followed migrating seabirds for hundreds of years to find these islands. You can still see feathers and bones of uh, some of these seabird species in ceremonial pieces uh, in the Hawaiian Islands today. The Hawaiian word for seabird is na manu kai, meaning the bird of the sea. So now I'm just going to tell you about a few of the species that we do see here throughout the year and uh, some of the species that we do see on our trips. So one of those being the Laysan albatross. The Laysan albatross is a large seabird with a wingspan of anywhere from 6 up to 7 uh, feet. These birds do spend most of the year out at sea. Uh, however, during the winter time, they will come to various islands in the Pacific to um, lay their eggs. About 99.7% of the Laysan albatross population will nest in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and we do have a few breeding colonies around the main Hawaiian Islands as well. The longest banded and the oldest known bird in the world is actually a Laysan albatross. Her name is Wisdom. She is about 70 years old now. And uh, she actually did, was reported to have a chick in 2019, and since we banded her and have been studying her, she's laid anywhere from 31 to 36 eggs. It's actually known among sailors for lace and albatross, the sighting of a lace and albatross to be a good omen, and the accidental harming or killing of an albatross uh, could bring bad luck to your crew and your boat. Another really cool species that we see here in Hawaii is the great frigate bird. Uh, these animals can be found throughout tropical islands in the uh, Indian and Pacific Oceans. The, this is the largest seabird that we see here in Hawaii with a wingspan anywhere from seven uh, up to seven and a half feet. These animals are known for something called kleptoparasitism. Basically what that means is that they steal from other birds. So, uh, and that is actually how they get their Hawaiian name, which is Eva Bird. Eva meaning thief. So basically what they'll do is in flight, they will grab hold of another bird's tail feathers with their bills and shake them until that bird regurgitates whatever it just ate. And then the frigate bird will uh, catch the fish before it hits the water. These birds are also kind of unique in the sense that they do not have those dense waterproof feathers that other seabirds have, so you will never see a frigate bird um, landing on the sea or resting on the water. If you do, that bird might be in trouble. Um, 
These birds are also really amazing and the fact that they can stay in flight for months out of time, they have been tracked to do, uh, to do so. What they'll do is they will ride thermal updrafts and cumulus clouds and um, they will stay in flight for weeks to months at a time. So you can identify these birds by their highly forked tail feathers. It's a very deep V shape and they're also very sexually dimorphic. Uh, which means that there's very obvious differences between the male and the female. The males have what is called a guler sac, or like a throat sac, and it's red, and they will blow this sac up uh, to compete for mates and stuff like that. It's said when the Eva bird flies out to sea, the rough seas will be calm. So just another example of how sailors use these birds uh, for navigational and weather purposes. Another beautiful seabird that we see here is the white-tailed tropic, uh, tropic bird. This is a little bit smaller seabird uh, with a wingspan of maybe anywhere from three to four feet. Um, also identifiable by the really long white tail feathers trailing behind their body. Uh, these guys are usually seen around really steep rocky cliff sides where they will actually lay their nests and they're one of the only seabirds that does not form colonies for breeding and they will do that in isolation. These birds are also known to be really impressive aerial acrobats doing these really beautiful dips and swoops and circles and things like that to attract mates. We also have the wedge-tailed shearwaters. Uh, these guys are in a group of seabirds known for being tube-nosed, um, along with the albatross, and uh, scientists think these guys have a heightened sense of smell to sniff out things like krill on the open ocean. These guys can be found uh, in tropical islands throughout the Indian and Pacific Ocean as well, and uh, they will come here during the summertime to lay their eggs. They actually uh, start to do that in June, so right about now. There's a lot of hikes and places you can go um, in the main Hawaiian islands, and you'll see signs that say, you know, Wedgetail Shearwater Nesting Area, please, you know, stay on the trail, because these guys, what they'll do is uh, they'll make burrows or nests in, like, open fields and stuff like that, so uh, you don't want to step on them. So it is very important to stay on the trails when you are hiking out here. These birds are identified uh, by their wedge-shaped tail feathers. They're also more of like a dark brown, grayish brown coloration, and they're also on the smaller side with a wingspan of maybe three, three and a half feet. So the last species that I'm going to talk about is the red-footed booby. Uh, there are seven species of booby birds around the world. We have three of them nesting here in the Hawaiian Islands, more of a medium-sized bird with wingspans anywhere from four, four and a half, maybe up to five feet, so not as big as the albatross and frigate bird, but not as small as the sheer water and that tropic bird that we've talked about. These birds are identified by their red webbed feet and their pale blue bill, with their uh, feather coloration being mostly white. They are also the uh, smallest booby species. So how the booby birds got their name comes from a Spanish slang term, bobo, which means foolish. And uh, they were given that name because of their awkwardness on land and uh, their lack of fear towards humans. So it made them very vulnerable to uh, having their eggs taken or being hunted, things like that. So these are just a few of the really incredible seabirds that we see out here in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, like I think I said earlier, there's about 24, two dozen species that come um, at any point in the year throughout the islands. And uh, unfortunately, these animals do face a lot of different threats. Uh, one of them being vulnerability to introduced predators like mongoose, feral cats, rats, if you visit the islands, uh, you'll notice we have very large feral cat populations and you'll see the mongoose running around. Unfortunately, these are animals that we introduced and uh, they have thrived here in the islands and they have decimated some of our native bird species. 
Another issue for these guys is getting entangled in fishing gear, whether it be from active fishermen, derelict or floating gear, or gear that has washed up on the beach at some of their nesting sites. And of course, as always, plastic pollution is an issue for these animals. A group of Australian researchers has predicted that about 90% of seabirds have ingested plastic at some point in their life. And the issue with this uh, plastic ingestion is that it does not degrade in their stomach and their stomach becomes full and they can't properly ingest and process uh, actual food and proper nutrients. So they could essentially starve. So as usual, there's a ton of things that you can do to help these animals out, whether you're in the Hawaiian Islands or not. If you are in the Hawaiian Islands and you think you see a bird in distress, uh, there's people that you can call that are trained to deal with these types of situations. There's different organizations and numbers for each island, but uh, organizations like the Hawaii Marine Animal Response Team, DLNR, and people from NOAA are trained to deal with uh, distressed seabirds and can get them the proper help if needed. Uh, there's different numbers for each island that you can call, but you can very, very easily Google and look up that information. It is very readily available. So if you think you see a seabird and help, then uh, call one of those guys. And then also, uh, obviously, just in our decisions as consumers every day. Things like eating sustainably caught seafood. This is something I've talked about before. Uh, some companies do produce more bycatch than others. What bycatch is, is not the intended catch. So if they're fishing for tuna and catch a bird, that's bycatch. So you want to make sure that uh, seafood that you're eating is not producing a lot of that. And then beach cleanups, uh, picking up debris, things like that are not only helpful for seabirds, but for turtles, whales, dolphins, and birds and er, animals inland as well. Uh, so organizing cleanups throughout your community is an awesome thing to do, not just for these animals, but for your community as well. And then of course, uh, reducing your single-use plastic uh, use, things like straws and uh, single-use utensils, plastic bags, stuff like that. Just keeping that stuff out of the environment is going to go a long way for these animals and for yourself. One thing I do want to point out that I don't think I've mentioned before is that uh, reducing your plastic is really important to focus on. Recycling is a great thing to do, but it has to be done properly, and the matter of the fact is that oftentimes it is not, and when it is not done properly, then everything is just thrown out anyways. There are different, different recycling rules for each and every city and county, so you have to look those rules up. You have to have clean items in your recycle bin, or it doesn't matter. So it's almost more important to focus on reducing your use of these items. Uh, be aware when you're buying things at the store. Can I reuse this for something or am I going to use it once and throw it away? Try to upcycle and reuse and reduce and as a last resort think about recycling and think about recycling right. <laughs>